both so pleased to have you here with us tonight for this, the first uh, kickoff event of Student Press Freedom Day. Our op-ed bootcamp this year um, is something that we're trying for the first time. And obviously we've hit a little cord um, as we have so many people who are joining us tonight. I wanna give you a few logistical instructions before I do a brief introduction and then we will have Steve um, uh, uh, give us his great knowledge about op-ed writing. First and foremost, please be aware that we are recording the workshop tonight and we will be posting it on the Student Press Freedom Day uh, website for other folks to take a look at it um, and to have it for posterity. So please know we are recording. Um, feel free to use the chat for questions or to just tell us um, how nice the weather is where you are and you can hold it over everybody. Know though that Steve is not checking the chat function during his presentation. We do have a chat moderator who's gonna get your questions to us so that we can ask them during the Q&A part of our presentation. Please make sure that you turn your screen to speaker mode so that you're gonna be able to see the slides um, and you'll be able to see the speakers up close and personal. And note that you all are muted for this call. We'll use the chat function for your questions. And now I'm really gonna get into the introductions. As I said, my name is Hadar Harris and I'm the executive director of the Student Press Law Center. SPLC has worked since 1974 to support, promote, and defend the First Amendment rights of student journalists and your advisors. We have a free legal hotline that you can access at www.splc.org. You can make an appointment to speak to one of our staff attorneys who can help you with any media law questions that might emerge things like copyright or freedom of information and where we really try to help as much as possible is on questions of censorship, which could emerge. We have many, many really usable, free, accessible legal resources on issues like copyright or FOIA or how to report about COVID or racial justice protests or elections or many other issues. Um, and we work to support grassroots, nonpartisan, student-led state-based groups to, per, to uh, press freedom, to uh, support press freedom legislation through our new voices initiative all across the country. We know why student press freedom is important because we hear your stories and we work on your cases and we support you student journalists in asserting your rights as independent journalists every day. And because of that, we established Student Press Freedom Day three years ago to ensure that the rest of the world hears your stories too. The rest of the world needs to know about the great work that you do as student journalists and understand also the challenges that confront you every day. So we wanted to create an opportunity for the world to know that student press freedom needs to be protected and supported. Just two days ago, we launched the Student Press Freedom Day website at www.studentpressfreedom.org. Hillary's gonna slam it up there in a screen share so you can take a look at it. It is filled with resources and tools to help plan an event around the day of Student Press Freedom Day. This workshop is just the first step in bringing the stories of press freedom to a broader audience. In years past, we've encouraged student journalists to write op-eds in their own papers and websites. And this year through this training, we're hoping that you're gonna be able to write op-eds which tell your story and support better protections for student journalists to place in non-student media outlets to get an even wider audience. There are other ways to take action for Student Press Freedom Day and Hillary just went through the uh, front of the website and you should really investigate it. Submit a video testimonial, plan a COVID safe event for your school or community, tweet and retweet and retweet on Friday the 26th about why hashtag student press freedom is important to you. And come to our Student Press Freedom Day Town Hall, which is gonna take place on Thursday, February 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern to talk with other students about why and how student press freedom plays a role in your life, your ideas on how to improve it and to protect it. It should be a very robust and interesting student to student conversation. You can check out that website for more details. So 
I want to thank a few people before we get really started and give you some tech instructions. First, I want to thank Dan Fermansky, our wonderful partner and consultant who is waving up in my corner, who's run point on coordinating all of Student Press Freedom Day this year for us. I'd also like to thank Danielle Dietrich, the master of our website that you just saw, Hillary Davis, who runs our New Voices uh, Legislative Initiative, and Alexis Mason of the SPLC staff for their help in setting up this workshop and doing so much behind the scenes work for Student Press Freedom Day. I'd like to thank our partner organizations who've helped plan tonight's event and all of the Student Press Freedom Day activities. They've reached out wide and far to bring more than 200 of you to this webinar tonight, to JA, CMA, ACP, NSPA, and so many others. I'd also like to give a big shout out to the National Society of Newspaper Columnists and the Online News Association, ONA, for their help in securing professional coaches who are gonna help many of you in the op-ed writing process. Finally, I wanna let you know that um, on February 11th, the National Society of Newspaper Columnists is actually holding a webinar on how to craft a freelance pitch. We're gonna put the link to that in the chat because as good partners, we wanted to also give you access to some of the things that they're doing as well. Finally, I wanna thank your, you and your advisors for just showing up tonight. And so here we are getting started. Our goal tonight is to inspire you, encourage you and empower you to draft op-eds about student press freedom. Please draft your op-eds. Let us know when you place them, get them published. Send us copies to studentpressfreedomday at splc.org. For those of you who want to be paired with a coach, we're going to talk about that at the end. And we're going to be dropping a link to sign up to ensure that you get matched with a coach. We have so many people who have signed up for this uh, uh, webinar that we want to be sure that we pair you with folks um, in the most efficient way possible and make sure that, that you all have a good experience. Last thing that I'll say is we uh, run a little bit long. We started a little bit late. We may go until a, around nine o'clock. So we may go a little bit longer than we had originally anticipated. With all of that, it is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce Stephen A. Holmes, who is our speaker tonight. Stephen is a veteran journalist with more than 40 years of experience in the business. He recently retired as the executive director of standards and practices at CNN. He's been national domestic policy editor at the Washington Post and a reporter and editor at the New York Times where he was part of a team awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 2001 for reporting on race relations in America. He continues to write op-eds and opinion pieces on CNN.com and other outlets, and you can find his work online all over the place. He's the author of Ron Brown, An Uncommon Life, a biography of the former Commerce Secretary and Chairman of the Democratic Party, who died while working in the Clinton administration, and you can see a poster um, of, of, that's the front of the book, right? It is. Um, right, over, over uh, Steve's shoulder. Um, one thing of significant note, he thinks I'm going to say he's a member of the SPLC Board of Directors, which is extremely important, but I think more relevant to this group is the fact that he put himself through college by driving a New York City taxi cab at night and still insists that that was the second best job he's ever had. We are so privileged and honored to have Steve Holmes with us tonight to talk about how to write an excellent op-ed piece. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us. And thanks, Steve. It's all over to you. Thank you, Kadar, and good evening, everybody. By the way, I, I used to always tell people that driving a cab, when I did job interviews, I would tell people that driving the cab was the second best job that I had. And they would ask me, well, what's the first? And I said, the one I'm applying for now. It was something, somewhat of an effective line. Anyhow. My goal tonight is to give you my thoughts on what makes an effective op-ed piece. And what by effective, I mean a piece that, that editors of opinion sections will wanna run and that readers 
will be impacted by when they, when they peruse it. Now, let me say from the start, these are my thoughts. The, uh, the idea of what's an effective op-ed piece is pretty subjective. Now, there's, there, it's more of an art than a science. There are very few hard and fast rules. There tends to be guidelines, suggestions, and the like. Um, you may listen and take in what I say tonight, and then tomorrow you'll see an op-ed that you think is really good and really effective, that is completely the opposite of what I told you tonight. That's okay. Like I say, it's more of an art than a science. So and what I'm gonna give you are things that have worked for me over the years and that um, I suggest that you might think about. So let's get started. First, I wanna read you a story. Oops, hold on a second. This is a piece that appeared in the uh, um, student newspaper at uh, Indiana University. It's a, it's a really, really excellent piece of journalism. In fact, it's one of those that we've selected and put on a website as an example of great student journalism that was produced in 2020. It's a story about a high school, a charter high school on the east side of Indianapolis, and that's, which the students were really the victims of, uh, of, of very a lot of gun violence, and it focuses focuses originally at the start on one 15 year old boy, uh, De Quincy Pittman. So let me just go over the lead on this. All right, it says the boy is 15 year old, 15 years old and full of metal. Bullet fragments are stuck in his arms, his leg, his side. A rod runs through his leg. A plate and screws hold his arm together. The Quincy Pittman limps into school on a rainy Monday morning in late February. It's his first day back in nearly two months and his clothes hang differently than they did before. After five surgery, a stay in the ICU and weeks of rehab, he's down maybe 20 pounds. So the, the, the tone and the, the, the thrust of this story is, which is very well written, is to elicit sympathy for for this young man and for his classmates. So let me give you um, a possible op-ed that I wrote off of this particular news story. Let me just read it real quickly. The Quincy Pittman demands that you care he was shot six times for a pair of sneakers. The Quincy Pittman demands that you care bullet fragments remain in his arms, his legs, his side. He demands that you care he's one of five students from his high school who were victims of gun violence last year. He demands you care that the school principal keeps ointments and gauze in her desk to bind up bullet wounds that have opened up during the day. Now, I, I put these two pieces side by side, not to talk about the differences between a news story and an opinion piece. I assume that you guys know the difference between an objective news piece and an opinion piece. But I, I wanna highlight this because what I wanna do is highlight the tone and the tenor of what I've written, because I wanna make the, the point of what one of the things you might wanna think about when you craft your, your opinion piece. You just, you don't wanna just write an opinion. What you want to do is bring a call to action. You want your piece to get people, to get readers off their butts and do something. You wanna rile them up. You wanna get them to, register to vote, to, to vote, to petition their elect, elected representatives, to boycott a company, to march, to stop marching, to um, think differently. The whole idea is you don't want your, your, your opinion piece to just be one that somebody reads and then leans back and says, oh, wasn't that a nice opinion? You want them to feel that they have to do something. That's one of the ways that um, I feel it becomes an effective piece. One of the things, it, 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 the call to action is good, but the call to action is only good if it's timely. Your piece has to be timely. It's gotta be on the news. Editors of opinion pages aren't that interested in running uh, a piece, an, an op-ed, for something that happened six years ago, six months ago, even six weeks ago. You wanna be as much as possible uh, on what's happened right that day or, or just a, a few days prior. Now, 
there are a lot of times when you have ideas for pieces that are what we call evergreens. They, could, they are really smart ideas, but they could run at any time. So what you then have to do is try and figure out how to make your piece timely, your evergreen timely. Let me give you an example. Here's a piece that ran on NBC's Think, written by a guy who's an acquaintance, uh, Robert Quinn, who's the director of an organization called Scholars at Risk. Now, Quinn's idea and what he argues in this piece is that truth is a fundamental human right and that, that people deserve that to be told the truth by politicians, business leaders, clergy, anybody in, in, in authority. Well, that's a real commendable sentiment but that can run anytime. And if an editor gets something that could run anytime, they'll, he or she will always find some excuse not to run it. So what did, what did Mr. Quinn do? He took what was an evergreen and he found a really good peg. The peg in this particular case was President Biden's inaugural dress. And what he, he honed in on and used was a quote from the inaugural, inaugural address in which he talks about there is truth and there is lies. Each of us has a duty and responsibility as citizens, as Americans, and especially as leaders, leaders who have pledged to honor our constitution and protect our nation to defend the truth and defeat the lies. So he uses this as a way to get to, to, to make his piece timely. If you read the rest of this, this op-ed, it's not about Joe Biden at all. It's about Quinn's idea uh, and notion of truth as a fundamental right. In fact, Biden is hardly mentioned in the rest of the piece. So what you have to do is figure out, if you have a good idea, figure out how to make it timely. Now, just like any other piece of journalism, you got to get people into it. So what you need to figure out how to do is come up with a provocative lead. It's people aren't going to read it if, if there's not a way to easier ease them into, into it. So how do you do that? Well, there's lots of ways, but one of my favorite ways to get people uh, into your piece is to make it personal. Make it about you. Make it about your experience or your friend's experience or your family's experience, and then extrapolate from that out to the world. I always think of it you know, that you go from you to the world you to the world. It just is a really tried and true way, an effective way to um, get people into your, into your um, piece. Let me give an example of that. Here's a piece that ran in uh, CNN.com from a woman uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic. Let's go through the lead and I'll read it really quickly. As my husband and I packed up the rental car on July 19th, strapped our 11 month old into our car seat, and began the drive from Brooklyn, New York to Dallas, Texas. I couldn't help but wonder how in the world we got here. I was going to Texas by car on my 40th birthday with plenty of masks and hand sanitizer in tow to say a final goodbye to my mother, Irina Papadimitro, who died from COVID on July 4th. It's a personal story. It's a, a way that brings you in. I don't know what she's gonna say further on about policy towards the pandemic and, um, and what should be done. But the point is, she's got you thinking about and reading about and, and caring about her because it's a personal story. So that's uh, one way, one effective way to try and get people into your piece. Now, the, you can have a, a, a really good lead, a snappy headline, but you gotta, one of the things that you have to do is answer the question that I always ask myself when I write. At bottom, what we're talking about is an opinion. This is an opinion piece. So who cares about your opinion? I mean, really ask yourself, who really cares about your opinion? There's lots of opinions out there. Anytime you go on Twitter, you'll, you'll realize, you know this, that there's lots of opinion. So who cares about yours and why should they care about yours? So let me give you the brutal, honest truth when you ask yourself, who cares about your opinion? The answer is nobody. 
Nobody cares about your opinion. Why should they? Nobody can. You, you could be, you know, they're not going to care about your opinion because you're cute, because you're student body president, because you're a football star. They don't care about your opinion. So nobody cares. Let me repeat this. Nobody cares about your opinion until you make them. So this is, this is your task. You have to make people care about what you say. And what, you, what that means is you have to make people realize why your opinion is important. It's the why of your piece. And you do it throughout your piece, but you really do it in your nut graph. You really, here is where you're gonna tell people that why they think, why they think, uh, why they should think what you have to say is important. So I, I really urge that you spend a lot of time crafting your nut graph and always thinking about why it is that your opinion is important. It's, it's the heart of, of what you do. If you can't come up with a reason about why your, your opinion is important, the battle is lost. It's just lost. So think hard about it. Spend a lot of time working on it. Write it, rewrite it. Uh, talk to your friends about it. Really, really hone in on that. Now, what are some suggestions that um, can help you sell your, your piece, that's to sell your opinion, telling people why it's important? One thing, avoid preaching to the choir. You know, there's, there's a lot of, not only there's a lot of opinions, there's a tendency that people have to uh, uh, focus their arguments towards people who already agree with it. That's not who you're trying to convince that your opinion is important. I always say, aim your arguments at your crazy uncle. You know, we all got the crazy uncle. Shows up thank every Thanksgiving, drinks a lot of wine, starts spouting off uh, the views that you think are crazy. You probably got them for from Newsmax or, uh, or uh, uh, One Nation News, or maybe even Rachel Maddow, you think that some of her ideas are nuts. The point is you have to convince him why he should take your argument seriously. He is the one, and fence it, he is the one that you should think about. Another way of saying this is, as you come up with the arguments, challenge your own arguments, think about what it is that can be said to knock down your own arguments and then and help, it will help you craft your arguments much better, help you make people realize why your arguments are more important. Some other uh, hints as to how you can get people to take your arguments serious, seriously and why they're important. Be prescriptive. Anybody can complain. Anybody can talk about how things are unfair or oppressive or fattening. Um, anybody can do that. You uh, can really make a difference and really get your pieces um, placed and people reading them if you provide solutions. It's always better if you can come up with solutions. They can be radical solutions, they can be moderate solutions. But the idea is to come up with something. Don't just complain. Redemption stories are really good. So your solutions, you, you can talk about how your solutions, how your proposed opinion and your solutions save this person, save that program, save the university, save the city council, save the planet, you name it. And the point is come up with how they work, how they, they were effective, how they save things, how they redeem people or programs. Redemption stories are, are, are always a hit. Now. The other one, which is happens to be my favorite, is come through with some original thinking. There's a, like I said before, there's a lot of opinions out there. How do you break through? How do you get editors to run them, to run your op-eds, and people to read them? Let me give you an example. This is a an op-ed piece, an opinion piece written by some guy by the name of Stephen Holmes. Um, it's a piece I, I wrote when I was at CNN and it was about 
it, it was uh, about the, the debate over the removal of Confederate monuments from the public square. Now, this debate has been raging on for quite some time, still rages on. And, but the arguments tend to be, you've heard the, all the arguments. One side says they should be removed because they're, they're, they're racist and they glorify a, a culture and a movement that, that, that try to keep blacks enslaved. The other side says, no, they should stay because they're part of our Southern heritage and removing them, it would be to uh, erase history. Well, what I try to do is come up with a different take. Instead of talking about which monuments should come down, I wrote a piece that talked about which monuments went up in the first place and why. And I focused in on this guy, Confederate General James Longstreet, which most of you probably never heard of, probably because there's no monuments to it. And why is that? The, uh, let me give you a really quick history lesson. I won't take too much time on that. Longstreet was a very able Confederate general. He was, uh, he helped Robert E. Lee win a number of battles at the beginning of, of the Civil War. So you would think because of his military uh, prowess, there would be lots of monuments to him in the South. There's almost none, very, very few. The reason has to do with not what he did during the Civil War, but what he did after the Civil War. After the Civil War, he returned to the South, he supported Reconstruction, he uh, 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 got involved in movements to help ex-slaves. He led a black state militia in Louisiana that fought pitched gun battles against white supremacists, supremacists in the streets of New Orleans. All this made Longstreet a traitor to the South. So consequently, there are no monuments to it. So the point I was trying to make is that there's no monuments. So how could you make an argument that removing mon monuments Confederate monuments is erasing history when you've erased Longstreet from history just uh, because you didn't like what he did after the, after the war. So let me, let me focus in on my nutcraft to make that point. What I wrote was, at a time of debate over the removal of Confederate monuments and amid charges that some protesters want to quote, erase history, unquote, Longstreet's mere expungement raises questions about whose history is being scrubbed away and why that history was created in the first place. It underscores that history and particularly the history of the Civil War is not simply an objective chronicling of facts. It is often shaped by people to promote particularly, particular political agendas and ideologies. Now, you can completely disagree with me. You can say this guy's all wet. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't care. What my editors at CNN liked about the piece is that it was a different way of looking at an argument. And so I urge you to try and, and think creatively because one of the best things you can do to make your op-ed effective is that after somebody has sat back, has read it, they sit back and say to themselves, huh, I never thought of that. So um, let me move on quickly to a couple of other things, a couple of other points. Be concise. It sounds simple, but it's, it's, it's really important. Most op-eds, the optimum, optimal length of an op-ed is about 800 to 900 words. Some publications require you to do for it to be less. No publication I've ever seen requires you to do more. 800 is kind of the sweet spot. That's what you should aim for. And one, one way that people tend to go longer than that is they try to make too many points. You know, they'll, they'll have six, seven, eight points that they wanna, they wanna make. Oh, I gotta make this point. Oh, I gotta make this point. Oh, I gotta make that point. Three to four, four really at the outset is the most. Three points is really the sweet, the sweet spot. Make three good points and hammer them home. Don't try, try not to go any more than that. And that, that'll be, That'll be concise, it'll be effective, it'll be hard hitting. Clear writing, you know, it, it, it's all, it's true in anything you do, but it's really true in, in op-eds. If your sentences are convoluted, if your logic doesn't fall into place, you'll just lose people. One of the things I always uh, uh, advise 
students to do or anybody to do when I'm editing is whatever you write before you hand it in, read it out loud to yourself. You, you do that, you'll discover your sentences, which sentences are too clunky or don't hold together are too complex to be followed. You'll, you, you'll, you'll find all of this out. You know, I always say that your ear is the best editing tool you have. Use it and trust it. It's a really great editing tool. To learn. Make sure you're factually correct. I mean, this should go without saying, but let me tell you, there's no way to get your opinion piece dismissed by editors or by readers is if you come up with a fact that turns out to be wrong. I'll just say, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. And you you'll, won't get it published. And if you get it read, nobody will take it seriously. So make sure everything is right. Now, so you've got a good um, uh, op-ed. It's, it's impactful, it's concise, it's right, it's, uh, it's clear, it's original, it's all these things. So what do you do now? What do you pitch it? Now, everybody wants to have, see their, um, their op-ed in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal or on CNN.com, everybody. But you know, the fact of the matter is, at this stage, it's probably best to try and pitch it to your local newspaper, but uh, or your 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 student newspaper. But don't feel constrained to and uh, just pitch it to your local newspaper or to your student newspaper. There's nothing that says you can't pitch it to another local newspaper, the next town over, or another student newspaper. Let's just say you're a student at Kent State and you wanna write a, a, an op-ed piece about uh, something the state legislature is gonna be doing concerning funding for state universities. Well, you can place it in the Kent State uh, student newspaper, which is fine. You, know? you can also place it or something similar, not exactly the same one, in the Ohio State newspaper. There's no reason that you have to limit yourself to your own newspaper. Most newspapers I had, including student newspapers that I've run across, have no prohibition of running uh, opinion pieces from people who aren't students at that university. So pitch it wherever you can. And as, uh, as many different places. Now, it is, tr it is true that it can't be the same op-ed piece in two different publications. Most publications will not run it. And if they find out that, that you've pitched them a piece that's already run in another newspaper, not only will they not run your piece, they may not run another piece that you come to, uh, to them later on. So change it around, find another aspect, but pitch it in multiple places. Pitch them in multiple places. So then the last piece of advice I'd give you don't meekly accept rejection. You pitch a, uh, a piece to your local newspaper or your college newspaper or to the Wall Street Journal or to whomever, and they come back and they say, no, this, this doesn't work for us. Well, ask them why. What's wrong? I mean, be respectful and be polite, but ask them, is the lead bad? Does it not make sense? Is it too long? Is it too short? Yes, don't just meekly say, okay, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a really inadequate person. I don't know why I even thought I'd run this here in the first place. Don't meekly accept rejection. It's your voice. You want it heard, fight for it. Anyhow, those are my thoughts. I'd be glad to entertain any questions you have. Steve, we have a ton of questions. Okay. And um, for those of you who want to, some of the questions you actually answered before we could even ask you. So okay. thank you. You're very good at that. Um, but for those of you who might have more questions, please put them in the chat. Dan is feeding them to me and we're, gonna, we're going to um, ask Steve as we go along. Um, Steve, let me, let me start with this. You, you were just talking about how you pitch a piece. And um, kind of, you know, don't meekly accept rejection. But let's talk about the steps of, of how you actually pitch a piece. Do you call okay. somebody? Do you submit it to them? Do you 
recommend having a pitch approved before you complete your draft or you send what you think is a finished product or do you call up and talk to somebody? Well, most publications have their own rules about pitching pieces. Generally, what they say is uh, uh, they'll, they'll provide a, um, a place on their website where you can, um, you can pitch a piece. And it, will be, it should be a completed piece, piece, not just an idea. If you have a relationship with um, a publication or a news organization, uh, you can call them up. When I worked at CNN and I was writing some opinion pieces, and even now that I'm retired, I have a relationship with the people at CNN and at some other uh, sites. So I can call people and say, hey, look, I got this idea. And usually after they stop laughing, um, I, can, I can actually uh, give them a pitch. Um, but generally they want a completed, uh, a completed uh, uh, piece. And so don't think, it's, don't think of it as a draft. Think of it as a polished piece that you're giving them because you may only get one shot at this pitch, right? And even if you don't meekly accept rejection, you still might get reject rejected. <laughs> so I would make sure I would polish it, make sure it's as, as good as it possibly can be and then send it to, to them as a, as a full and completed piece. So one of the things that you said is, is you want to get the huh factor, the huh, I never thought of that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and for all of you on the call as we're thinking about student press freedom day, I'll tell you, most people really don't think about the struggles of student journalists, they don't think about the need to protect um, student press freedom rights. They don't think about the impact of Hazelwood that allows for administrative censorship of student work in many places. So they also don't think about the fact that student journalists are, are, are filling in in news deserts where there aren't commercial outlets covering the community. There's a lot of, huh, I never thought about that in the work that students are doing day to day. But one student asked as, house, as high school writers, how do we establish credibility? And the idea that our opinion is important is it more about the quality and research behind the opinion itself? Or how do I establish that? How do I, as a high school student, establish that credibility? I, I think you hit on it. It, it. As a high school student, you are way, way too easily dismissed by editors and readers. You have to make them understand the importance of your voice. And that has to come through the quality of your writing and the quality of your ideas. You can't automatically assume that anybody is going, it goes back to, to what I said before, who cares about your opinion? That's difficult for, for anybody. It's difficult for me to answer that question, uh, who cares about my opinion and how do I make them care? It's doubly difficult for high school students, but on something like, uh, on an issue like student press freedom, it's uh, doubly important. And now, Again, if you want to talk about as a high school student about student press freedom, one of the suggestions that you might seriously consider is going back to one that I mentioned early on. Make it personal. What's been your personal experience involving censorship or um, not having you know, being allowed to get access to particular documents? Make it personal so that people understand that 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 denying the freedom you have to, uh, for students has denied freedom for, for you. So think about making it as personal as possible. Also tell you that you all, you know, we talk a lot about the front row seat that student journalists have had to one of the greatest impacts of the pandemic. You all have been sitting front row when more than 70 million students from pre-kindergarten through graduate school have been forced into remote learning. What does that do to your community? What did that do to your newspaper? What role did your newspaper play or, or your media outlet play as a result of this drastic transformation in the way that schools actually operate? Um, how did you get information out? You have unique perspectives that sometimes you 
as students don't even realize or recognize. So you have big stories to tell. You have big stories to tell about covering racial justice protests or even confronting race in your communities as young people in youth led movements. So, you know, don't underestimate the stories that you have to tell and the stories about press freedom that you have to tell. I'm sorry, I'm just interjecting my own editorializing here, <laughs> but I do want okay. to be sure that folks, you know, understand that you do have a unique perspective. Let me go back to some of the more tangible and logistical questions. Um, folks are asking about the editing process. Mm -hmm. So, so somebody asked, what is your editing process like? And somebody else said, I second the question about the edi editing process. I almost feel too reliant on my editor sometimes, simply because I find it extremely difficult to put mental space between myself and drafts so that I can see it more clearly. That's especially true for opinion pieces, many of which involve content I have a great amount of investment in, either overtly or subliminally. How do you yourself try to put space between you and your drafts? One of the things you have to remember about the editing process, well, two things, two things uh, you should remember. First, it's your piece, your name's going on, not the editor's name. So if the editor wants to make changes that you're not comfortable with, don't meekly accept them. You need to push back and say, no, look, this is what I mean to say. Now, it's it's a good editor will engage in in a in a spirited discussion, and will listen to what your points. And you need to listen to what the editor has to say as well. But in the end, it's your piece, right? And the other thing about editing, my uh, uh, I used to date a, uh, an editor a long time ago, and I would say something that drove her crazy about editing. This is when I was a reporter when I was very disdainful of editors. Right. Um, the definition of editing is just somebody else's opinion, right? So just because somebody's an editor doesn't necessarily mean that they're right. And maybe I'm just saying the same thing. Fight for what you believe your piece to be. Be open to change, but fight for what you want to say. Again, it's your voice. Your name is on it make sure that um, uh, you engage in a spirited discussion with your editors. And it's especially true on opinion pieces because it's your opinion. So let me ask you this. Um, a, a student asked, should I try to get a publication whose editorial positions I greatly disagree with to run an op-ed, especially if my op-ed takes issue with their editorials? Yes. <laughs> that was just, uh, you had to think about that for a long time. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, most, most, not all, but most um, uh, publications that I know of that have a particular editorial stance will run uh, op-eds that completely disagree with the editorial stance of the paper or the news site. Uh, Wall Street Journal has a very, very conservative editorial page. Um, they run Progressive, they don't run, I can't say they run a lot, but they'll run a progressive op-ed. New York Times is a very progressive editorial stance, but they, they run op-eds from conservatives. It's um, don't shy away from pitching a piece to a publication whose editorial stance is, is something that is, doesn't line up with yours. Um, if they don't want to run it because of that, well, you know, there's not much you can do. Uh, except try to shame them into, into running on life. And, and the best argument is, oh, so you don't believe in free speech, right? Um, so don't shy away from it. Uh, generally, they, they will run it. Um, um, somebody asked if I publish an op-ed on Medium or on my personal website, can I then pitch it to a newspaper or news outlet? That's a good question. Um, I would say Medium, probably not your own personal website, probably. Um, it's Medium, again, even though, you know, it's, 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 it is a, um, a third party, if you will. It is a, a platform that publishes 
um, uh, opinions and views. And so therefore it's published as opposed to your website, which some people might argue is also a platform and we publish it, but you could argue, well, that's just my personal website. Um, the best way to get around it is um, give them a different take from what you published on your website or on media. If you, um, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a good example now. Um, I, and not, not one is not coming to mind. So anyhow, give it a different take. Look at it from a different angle. Uh, it could be close to what you published on on your personal website or on Medium, but make it make it somewhat different so they can't say, "Oh well, you know, you've already published this somewhere." Um, two other big questions. One is about if I've submitted an op-ed to a publication and they haven't published it, how, but I haven't heard back from them, how long should I wait before trying to get another publication to run it? Uh, the quick and short answer is not long, right? Um, a week max, and, and even that is really stretching it. Um, it goes back to, to what I said earlier about timeliness. The longer your piece sits unpublished, the less timely it becomes. So don't give them too much time. I would say if you, if you don't see it in two days, get on the phone or send them a text or send them an email and say, hey, what's going on? You know, do you not like it? Is there something I could change? Um, have uh, what, uh, uh, what, is there a problem? Should I be considered and raise the possibility? Should I be considering uh, pitching it to somebody else? Um, generally, after two days, they'll say, "Oh no, 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 no! We just haven't gotten to it." Just then, give them one more day, and then get back to it. Just don't let them string you along for a long time. You just again be polite, be respectful, but don't let them string you along. But I think that point of you know what you can pick up the phone and call them. Yes, And you can say, I submitted this to you. I just want Absolutely. to make sure A, that you've seen it and B, I'm waiting for a response for you. That is completely a, a great strategy. And in oh, fact, absolutely. they might be ignoring it and they'll pick it out of the pile because you had the tenacity to, to, to call them. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's a good strategy and, and I would use it. Yeah, so, you know, go, go, go after it. Um, mm -hmm. Here are a couple questions about money. What if okay. your pitch gets, yeah, so, what are, so A, do you get paid for writing an op-ed if they accept it? And if your pitch gets approved, but they're not giving you very much money for it and you expect more, should you take it? Because many media outlets just think that it's okay. You know, we, you should be happy to be published. Most media outlets think you should be happy to be published and they don't pay most. Um, uh, it, in fact, um, I wrote a number of pieces after I left CNN, I wrote a couple of pieces for a particular outlet and they said, thank you very much. And they, and they ran them. And then finally, after, after I submitted the second one, I said, hey, am I getting paid for this? And I said, oh, oh yeah, yeah. I said, oh, great. I want to get paid for the first one too, right? So, so they did. But generally, if they can get away without paying you, they will, right? And generally, if there it is their general stance that they don't pay for um, for op eds, um, they they just generally don't. They think you should be happy to be published, and in some ways, you should. Sometimes that's okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I guess the last question, we've had a lot of questions, but I'm mindful of our time, um, is how do you find inspiration? Where do you look? Oh. It's a good inspiring kind of final question. Well, I read a lot, right? Um, and I think a lot about what I read. Um, and I'm forever picking apart uh, pieces that I read, even, even pieces 
from publications that I trust greatly. I, um, I always tell, um, I, I taught a course um, last year uh, on press literacy. And one of the things I stress is that don't trust anybody. Don't trust anybody, even you know, news organizations, news outlets that you really think are good. On individual stories, make them prove what they have to say. So I look at a story or look at an issue and I start thinking about it. Are they, is there another way of looking at it? Are they proving their point? Um, are they uh, making sense? And what I find is out of that exercise comes ideas. Um, so it, it kind of goes back to what I said about pitching to your crazy uncle. You got to challenge everything. You got, you know, is that really right? Should, should, um, is it really right for the house to remove um, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene from a committee for Democrats to do it? Is it really right? Don't accept it. Just think about it. Well, is it really right? What happens if Republicans get the majority and start removing Democrats from committee assignments? You know, you may not, I may not write a, an op-ed piece about that, but you should think about it. And that's where my inspiration is. You know, read a lot, keep up with it, with the news, but everything you should think about. Just don't accept anything. Just think about whether or not it makes sense. Is it right? Uh, are there flaws to it? Just think, think all the time. That's my inspiration. That is a great inspiration. We're happy that you continue to think. We're happy that you continue to write and we're happy that you continue to share your knowledge with all of us. So Steve, thank you very, very, very much. Um, there are a few questions that we didn't get to, but um, if you do have additional questions, just uh, reach out to us and let us know. Um, I want to, before we end tonight, be sure that for any of you who are um, hoping to and planning to and want to write op-eds for Student Press Freedom Day, we want to help you do that. And I'm going to ask Dan to, to drop into the chat a sign up link for any of you who plan to write an op-ed for Student Press Freedom Day about your experiences and why student press freedom is important. Um, and we will pair you with a coach who can help you in the conceptualizing, the editing and the pitching of your piece um, to local or national outlets, um, you know, as you help to identify what would be kind of the best match for the piece that you're writing. Um, again, as I noted before, we've got journalists from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. These are people who write op-eds and columns all the time. Um, some folks from the uh, um, Online News Association, some advisors from schools around the country and other journalists who are helping us in the coaching. So if you are interested and committed to writing an op-ed piece over the next 10 days, um, that we can try to get published, that you can try to get published um, in support of Student Press Freedom Day. Please sign up so that we can match you with a coach. If you want to work with a, uh, a partner, a friend, a colleague um, to write something together, could even be somebody on this chat that you didn't know before, um, please sign up and let us know that that's what you intend to do so that we can pair you together with the coach. Um, even if you signed up when you registered and you said that you wanted to work with a coach, please fill out this form again. We had so many people who signed up for this workshop that we need to be sure that we're matching people appropriately and that we're going to fill all the needs um, and the, the requests that are coming in. So um, again, the link is in the chat. We hope that you will fill out, um, fill this link out um, as soon as possible. Can students fill this out tonight, tomorrow, or do they need to do it tonight? I'd open up the link so that you have the link and you can fill it out. We are gonna try to start matching people tomorrow, but it just depends on how many we get in um, and we'll be matching people over the weekend. Um, just managing your expectation, um, you know, as we match people up, we will reach back out to you. We will introduce you to your coach. Um, they're not going to call you tomorrow. 
Um, it's going to be something that gives you all a chance to start thinking about your ideas, start drafting your op-ed, and, um, and then the coaches will reach out to you probably in the very beginning of the week next week. So I don't know if there's anything else that we need to update folks on. Make sure you're checking out. Um, um, the, the, the coaching is really around the Student Press Freedom Day op-eds. Um, so, you know, the, these folks have volunteered their time to help get the message out about student press freedom. Um, but if you work on an op-ed for Student Press Freedom Day, you'll have an invaluable experience, I think, um, working with these coaches who can help you also as you think about future stories. So again, I want to thank Steve very, very much for your time, for your wisdom, for your encouragement. And I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. I know we're all zoomed out, um, but it really uh, is a pleasure to see you all here. And I hope that you will use your creative energy, come up with some great stuff to do for Student Press Freedom Day. Op-eds, Twitter tweet storms, uh, um, or COVID safe um, activities at your school, in your community to kind of keep that message moving forward about why and how student press freedom is so important. Um, thank you again, everybody, for your time and for all that you do uh, as student journalists. We support you. And if you ever have any legal questions, sblc.org, get in touch with us. Thanks again for coming tonight. Have a great night. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank you. Yes. We're happy to have you. Oh, you've supported us for 25 years. You, we would not be able to do journalism without SPLC. Uh, well, I'm so glad that we had that on the recording. It's perfect. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and, and we will be here for another 25 whenever you need us. Oh, I don't know if I can make it that long, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. I'm going to stop the recording.